been absolutely fantastic to uh, see so many fabulous events around the country today um, to mark World, uh, World Human Rights Day. Um, I do think sometimes perhaps in this country we don't pay enough attention to our human rights and to question uh, where they're going to, how they're being uh, uh, eroded or where they're being strengthened. Um, so this evening's guests are from Scottish Pen. Um, issues of freedom of expression, human rights and the hampering of these things by individuals, institutions and states have been the concerns of the worldwide network. Um, which is, and Scottish Pen was established in 1927, so it's been going for an enormously long uh, time. Scottish Pen's members have been uh, committed to fostering a dynamic literary culture in Scotland, vital for the nation to play its part on the international stage in highlighting and campaigning for writers under threat. Um, so I'd, uh, without further ado, I'd like to thank Scottish Pen for facilitating this event and welcome Lisa Clark, Scottish Pen, uh, project manager to chair this evening's event and introduce our eminent panel. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Helen. Um, yeah, so as Helen's just said, I'm Lisa Clark and I'm the project manager at Scottish Pen. Um, so I'd like to start by welcoming you all to tonight's event um, and just introducing a bit about uh, what we do and who we are. Um, so it's been a strange year for Scottish Pen as it has for everyone. Um, I joined Scottish Pen as project manager on the 1st of April during the height of the first lockdown. And personally, I've found great comfort and inspiration in learning about the organization's work since then. Um, before joining Scottish Pen, I worked with several other charities, including Children in Scotland, the Scottish Commission for Learning Disability, Zero Tolerance and LGBT Youth Scotland. So supporting human rights and um, fighting discrimination has always been at the heart of my work. However, this evening on Human Rights Day, I'm delighted that we have some time to focus on the question of freedom of expression for writers in Scotland. Um, I'd like to welcome our two guest writers this evening, Dave Manderson and Leela Soma. Um, Dave is the chair of Scottish Pen's Writers for Peace Committee and he lives in Glasgow. Uh, he won the Robert Louis Stevenson Fellowship in 2017 and a Scottish New Writers Award some years before that. He's published a novel, a book of polemics, short stories, articles and non-fiction. Um, Leela Soma was born in Madras India and now lives in Glasgow. Her poems and short stories have been published in several anthologies and publications. She has published three novels, um, short stories and two collections of poetry. She was also nominated for the Pushcart Prize in 2020 and was shortlisted for the, oh no, I'm not going to know how to pronounce this, <laughs> Airbag <laughs> Prize this year too. Um, so yeah, a lot of her work um, reflects her dual heritage of India and Scotland. So um, welcome, welcome to both of you. Um, and yeah, I'd like to probably um, start by giving you an opportunity to just speak broadly about human rights issues that, um, that you feel impact writers most seriously. Um, obviously, Scottish Pen does a lot of work advocating for writers in prison internationally, for journalists facing censorship, um, and for underrepresented voices in global literature more generally. Um, so what would you say, um, what would you see as the main threats to freedom, uh, freedom of expression for writers in, in the world today? Um, and I'll, I'll start with Dave first, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Lisa. Thanks for, that was a lovely introduction. Um, and thanks to Leela for taking part too. Uh, yeah, my name is Dave and I'm the chair of the uh, Writers for Peace Committee at the moment. And I'd like to echo something that uh, Lisa just said uh, about, you know, putting more into this organisation. The more you do, the more you get back from it because you get a kind of contact with writers nationally and internationally that you probably wouldn't have uh, if you weren't involved with an organisation like this. As Helen said, Scottish Pen was uh, established in 1927 um, and it's part of an international organisation. There are uh, pen, uh, pen organisations, pen centres 
in over 100 countries and they're operating. And when you begin to get in touch with that sort of network, you realise that um, other countries have uh, enormous problems that we don't have. We have our own human rights issues too here, but in other countries, uh, things can be really, really serious. And over the last few years, I've been privileged to be involved with a number of the campaigns that Penn has uh, run, uh, notably uh, support for Ilhan Sami Chomak, most recently at the Day of the Imprisoned Writer. And we were able to have Scottish poets uh, read and uh, uh, Turkish poets have their material read uh, in response to these sort of um, uh, strictures they are facing. So Ilhan Sami Chomak has been in prison for 26 years. He's a Kurdish uh, man who was in prison when he was a very young man on a charge that was uh, something like setting a fire somewhere near uh, an encampment uh, of soldiers. Um, he didn't do anything, but he got a 40 year sentence. He's served 26 and he's got another nine to do because he's got time for remission. So that's the sort of person that we try to represent. And we do this through um, things like readings and then asking people to write letters to ambassadors and to diplomats just to pressurize. And people who were at that conference told us that this makes a difference. You know, if a Turkish person sends a letter, it makes no odds really inside Turkey at the moment. But if somebody from outside does the same thing, it really does make a, a, a big difference. Um, we've also worked on several other things like uh, Daphne Caruana Galicia's um, unfortunate death in Malta, a journalist who was investigating that government's links to organised crime. And she got into her car one day and it just exploded and she was killed, very sadly killed, and her family were in touch with us. And we've tried to pressurise uh, the government there as well. At the moment, maybe Lila wants to say something more about Vara Vara Rao, but uh, he is in prison. Uh, he's an extremely well-known author um, in India, and he's been diagnosed with COVID. Nobody's giving him any, any additional support. Uh, he's suffering terribly. And again, we're, we're writing letters to uh, diplomats and to our own uh, foreign secretary. And um, the one thing, I'll, I'll, I'll just let, let Lila say something after this, but the other one that we were heavily involved with that was, had a very happy ending was the case of Beruz Bichani, uh, who uh, was imprisoned on Manus Island, caught between uh, immigra immigration law and um, entering New Zealand, and was seemed to be like many people held there permanently. He uh, wrote a novel, which he tweeted out one line at a time, uh, it was published, it won a major prize, a Victoria Prize, and uh, he's since uh, been given his visa. And that's like something that's very meaningful to us. And it's been a joy to work on these sorts of things because it, it just puts you in touch with the rest of the world. So I'll, I'll leave my bit there if, 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 if you want to say anything, uh, Lila or whoever. Yeah, I can just join in and say a few my Tappanese worth. Um, basically uh, with Scottish Pen, I remember uh, at Kelvin Grove Museum, we had an um, event with uh, Al Matnabi Street, which is, uh, you know, a card bomb in the middle of a street filled with books and, and writers. And uh, um, a person from San Francisco decided that he'll start this kind of almost revival of the street. And it just shows the power of the pen if all of us could, in fact, join together and and you know, pressurize the government. Now it has actually more or less come back. That was 2005 when the car bomb went in. Um, I think Dave has looked at quite a lot of important, uh, um, uh, you know, prisoners, uh, as well as um, freedom of expression being suppressed. I just thought I'd look at just one example, which is China. And uh, we've got the Uyghur Muslims, which have been, um, you know, more or less, segregated um, in the Xiangjiang, I think I'm pronouncing it right, province in China. Uh, I think the one that is really, really worrying is a poet, and I hope I'm spelling it right uh, or uh, pronouncing it right, Chimengul Awit. Now she was actually an editor as well as a poet of a state-run radio, um, as well as writing her uh, various um, um, books, etc. But she's actually been taken and uh, not just imprisoned, 
but along with her, 435 people of Uyghur Muslims have actually been um, sent to re-education camps. Now we're not talking about Mao's time, we're talking about 2020. And I think there has been, um, I can't say, well, there has been a total silence from United Nations, would you believe? But I think um, Joe Biden, the president-elect, has put it in very clear terms. And he said, this is genocide. You know, this is a kind of, uh, because they've been using um, very surreptitious methods. You know, they've used things like mass surveillance through the phone apps that people are using, you know, and then actually giving them a points-based system of how they re-educate themselves and retrain them. And I think that is more pernicious and more difficult because China says, no, we haven't done anything. We're re training them. You know, we are not actually imprisoning them. We are not actually doing anything against human rights. Now, this is something that all writers should be really, really, um, you know, worried about and do something and be active about it. I'm sure Scottish men will be uh, a leading light in that. Uh, there are also a very good program, Panorama on November 25th, the BBC, which actually talked about this particular uh, treatment of the uh, Uyghur Muslims in China. One other thing which disturbed me today was this, just as we were coming on, um, there was a mention of an Afghan journalist, a woman journalist. I couldn't get a full name, I think it's Malalai Mawandi, who's been shot dead in Afghanistan. Mm. Now she is a journalist. So to get any kind of, and her, her mother was also an activist and she was also, I think, um, you know, suppressed in, in some form or the other. So in some ways, I think the world situation is pretty grim. And with that, I think I'll get back to Lisa perhaps. And, uh, um, you know, I wish Boris Johnson had joined in with Joe Biden being very clear about this kind of harassment, but he's got his own problems just now, I guess. So, um, so. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, uh, both of you. I think you've really, just highlighted the, the landscape that writers around the world are trying to operate in. Um, you know, everything from um, kind of a surveillance culture and censorship to, to imprisonment and, you know, brutal violence. You know, there's a real, um, yeah, spectrum of <laughs> um, issues that writers um, are facing around the world. Um, so thanks for that, um, that kind of opening statement. And I think, Dave, you know, you've really... Um, shown the kind of flip side of that as well which is that there's an international movement of that's focused on solidarity with different countries and um kind of pulling together the um the strength um that writers have when they come together and when pen centers come together um with those kind of shared values um and kind of fierce defense of freedom of expression at the core so um you know <laughs> hopefully not um yeah, hope, hope, hope isn't all lost, I don't think. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I would like to move on a little bit to um, maybe link some of those issues that you've highlighted with the experience of writers in Scotland. Um, so yeah, moving a bit closer to home, how do you, um, what kind of threats do you think that Scottish writers might have um, to their freedom of expression? And Oh, obviously the, the scale might differ, but are there commonalities there? Are there um, kind of common issues that we can see um, in this culture too? Well, I think so. I hope that's all right for me to come in there. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, I mean, uh, we are very lucky compared to other parts of the world, but we have our own issues. Uh, one thing that we, Scottish Pen put out a little while ago is called the Chilling Report. And actually, it touches on something Lila just mentioned, the use of surveillance or even the possible use of surveillance. Because, of course, if surveillance is being used, people aren't always aware that it is. And there's always the prospect that it might be. So the Chilling Report was uh, written by Nick Williams, who was with us, still with us, uh, and uh, it, it had a big impact. And it's about the use of big data by companies to survey and watch us and monitor us and learn our tastes and habits and um, what we want, what we want to buy, etc. Um, but also the possibility of surveillance taking place through all sorts of means, some of which we may not be aware of, 
others of which emerge after we're using something that maybe seemed quite uh, benign at first, like mobile phones and Siri and all these things, you know, there is the idea that they're, they're listening in um, and uh, it, it's a distinct possibility. So what does that mean for Scottish writers? Well, I think one of the big dangers is self-censorship because people are increasingly aware that they are being watched. And when it comes to doing research for writers, it's pretty important that you have the um, uh, freedom to go and look at any book you wish. That's what research is, it's hunting down facts. And that's fine if it's the sort of subject that doesn't necessarily raise the hackles of uh, security agencies or uh, any other people who may be uh, keeping an eye on what we're taking a look at. Uh, it's not that, you know, as this is definitely happening, although I think Edward Snowden uh, did release information to say that the military in America are doing this. The problem is that people don't know. Uh, they can't be certain whether they're being uh, surveyed or not. And writers may be reluctant. They may find themselves reluctant to enter certain areas where this could possibly be going on. And self-censorship is a big problem anyway, because writers can be writing from marginalised groups or from peripheral places, places of poverty or places of challenge, and it's harder for them to write anyway. Um, so, you know, um, the multiple challenges that they face can be so discouraging that they may actually be silenced. And I think there's a lot of that can happen. So silencing through uh, the possibility of censorship is, is one thing. There's lots of structural inequalities um, that um, affect all, all uh, the possibilities of writers being heard. Uh, the growth of poverty, um, there's austerity in which what we've just been through there. And generally, people on the periphery, um, it's, it just is harder to write. Um, another thing I'll, I'll mention, I'll just leave it after this, was um, uh, Penn successfully um, uh, pressured the Scottish Government into a change to the defamation bill. Uh, and that came about through the case of the MSP Andy Whiteman, uh, who wrote a fantastic book, The Poor Have No Lawyers, and um, uh, wrote something on a blog that was a, a bit critical of a private company. The private company then uh, brought this huge action against him for defamation. And because uh, of changes to the law, he wasn't able to, he wasn't able to afford a defence which meant that if it had gone ahead, he would have been forced to quit as an MSP, he would have been silenced, et cetera, et cetera. So simply very wealthy people can bring defamation suits against people who aren't wealthy uh, and get away with it. So I think, you know, Penn had a great deal to do with changing that law and that was a big achievement for us, I think. But I'll, I'll leave it at that if, if, if you want to bring Leela in, Lisa, or something. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Leela? Yeah, um, if you don't mind. Uh, I know that from time immemorial, you know, there's always been censorship, even in Britain, you know, that was Marlowe or Oscar Wilde. Um, but we have moved on with time, or so we think, you know, um, the famous Lady Shatley's lover was not all that long time ago, etc. And there are still restrictions on people like LGBTQ people, um, and trans writers, etc. But I think uh, I, I, I would like to address perhaps what a very small incident that happened to me that Dave was talking about, you know, about what these, what looks like an innocuous thing. Uh, my latest novel came out on the 4th of November and on the 12th, on the 14th of November was Diwali. And my publisher said, well, I'm going to give a, a discount to, to people because it is a, a, a kind of multicultural um, well, it's the first Scottish Asian detective, so they thought it's a good idea. Now, I was promoting it um, on Twitter, which is a social platform that everyone's aware of. I just maybe retweeted it three or four times at the, at the most, and uh, I, I was completely blocked suddenly, and I didn't know, no reason given, nothing, uh, and I just couldn't get access to, to the Twitter platform at all. Uh, I racked my brain, changed my password words, and I couldn't get back again. And after a long time, I thought perhaps it has been the artificial intelligence which has picked up two of the words, perhaps murder and the word mela, and either it has decided, you know, it's violence or it has something to do with, uh, you know, a kind of 
multicultural world, a word that is, you know, and, and join the two up in some way. Um, so it is really, really worrying if, if a person, an author has to have this kind of censorship, not by just human beings, but by a machine, in other words, you know, possibly. Um, I did write to Twitter again and, and told them this is a title of my book. So please, you know, restore it. And again, no answers, no personal anything. It was just restored without giving any uh, reason. So how do we know, you know, who's listening in, who's monitoring what you're writing, who's going to take something as simple as a title of a book, you know, with the word murder and mailer, it can be actually blocked. Um, so the other thing, of course, that is extremely important to me is obviously what Dave was addressing, you know, the the kind of people in the periphery and the structural inequalities. Um, I think most people will be aware that in 2018, um, Scottish BAME um, ethnic minority um, network was actually um, started or established in Edinburgh, it's a very nice young uh, group of writers and we've got Leila Abulela also in it. Mm. Um, but there's some, they did a, a, a very small, um, survey immediately just to present data to get an idea and it was quite interesting to see that 62.5 percent of the people who responded within the last 12 months felt that their ethnic uh, identity or race had actually been a barrier to you know uh, be, to any kind of success in the uh, literary sec sector. You've also got to remember that um, within Scotland, there is quite a high percentage of people who don't think or use English as their first language, you know. So there are barriers of language, there are barriers of access to, because of, of the color of the skin or race or identity. Uh, so I think we need to perhaps discuss this a wee bit more in, in, in um, greater detail. Um, so yeah, that's so interesting. It, I think you've both um, you've presented kind of a kind of dual problem where there's the, the issue of actually gaining access to a space where you can share your voice and feel confident about um, putting your work out there. Um, and then maybe a sense also that once your work is out there, you kind of lose control over it and whether that um, it becomes subject to the forces of rich and powerful people like they've um, alluded to with defamation action or whether it is, you know, totally <laughs> non-human algorithms that step in yes. and <laughs> make a judgment on your work, you know, um, from the kind of starting point of being able to, um, yeah, to, to, to feel you have the confidence to, um, to write and to identify yourself as a writer and pursue opportunities if they're if they're there, to um, yeah feel feeling safe about um, what's going to happen when 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 that's out there. There's a lot a lot to consider. I totally agree. Um, Can I just add something? Yeah. Uh, would that be all right? I, um, <clears throat> I mean, I've I've been reading up a, a wee bit about artificial intelligence and so on. And there was an article, I can't remember the name of the author, in The Guardian, and uh, the author described the release of untested algorithms as equivalent to the thalidomide uh, plague or, or the fiddle thalidomide, um, whatever you call it, the, the injections that led to those disastrous um, um, uh, generation of people being affected. And, um, you know, because we don't really know the impact of this stuff and, not, and, and algorithms are not tested. They're just put out there in the belief that artificial intelligence is good. And, you know, there's an awful lot of strange stuff happening at the moment about what people believe, which we might move on to a bit later. But, uh, you know, we, we are subject to that all the time now. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, maybe just before we move on to counter some of those Twitter issues, just a wee reminder, I've got Leila's book here as well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if anyone hasn't checked it out yet, um, as she said, it's it's Murder at the Mela. And um, yeah, let's fight back against the Twitter <laughs> algorithms and support support that brilliant publication. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose just to kind of build on, um, on um, some of those kind of broader societal structural issues you've touched on, Leila, um, 
yeah. for me it kind of raises the issue of yeah access to literature access to opportunities as a writer um, and a lot of uh, areas of life that have a kind of indirect but real impact on you know would-be writers um you know we've already mentioned poverty kind of in passing but um what would you what would you both say um are the barriers to free expression that maybe are caused by that wider climate you know it's not about um direct censorship of a journalist's specific article but um yeah the kind of broader economic issues or cultural norms um how would you say that the kind of wider landscape that writers in Scotland find themselves in um, has, a, has an impact on their, their freedom of expression? Um, if I can just kind of um, say a wee bit more about the, the kind of experience of the BAME community, because that was only a short, a small um, mm -hmm. survey done by what is really a nascent group. You know, I'm sure there are the, the respondents, I think, were about 36. Uh, so that's a tiny, tiny uh, number of people. I'm sure there are many more writers or emerging writers from the BAME community. I'm sure there are, and I've heard already, that there are people who are writing in their own language, but unable to find translators, which is another uh, you know, barrier to, to access. Um, they're also finding that actually going in front of, uh, you know, or, or writing a letter to uh, um, one of the big five um, publishing houses, you know, they have no idea about who to approach, what the, the, the actual uh, implications are, uh, how to look for an agent, you know, the kind of, of normal um, things that perhaps a writer who is born, brought up here is very familiar with. So that is another thing. So there's a language, there's a problem of obviously not knowing the culture, as you say, of, of how do you approach any of this um, part of the publishing industry. The publishing industry itself um, has often kind of uh, used the words, and I have had it once to me right at the beginning, oh, I think um, Asian novels are not commercial enough. In other words, it will not sell in bulk, you know, in hundreds of, uh, you know, thousands of uh, or millions. So we're not all J.K. Rowling's, we're not all Salman Rushdie, but our voices are valid, you know, for our own community, for our own. So access in, in that sense, um, the, I think there is a, a, has to be a recognition by the publishing, um, you know, sector of society. I think I've been incredibly lucky that a small independent publisher has always taken my, um, book to publish, you know, it's just been, uh, and, I, and I know that many people, including, I think I should mention our book winner, um, you know, Douglas Stewart with the Shaggy Bain has actually managed to, to get it after 32 rejections, I've been told. Having said that, we should obviously address poverty. And in my own book, uh, I've mentioned food banks and, you know, obviously everyone knows about Rashford and, um, you know, has uh, basically appealing to something that shouldn't happen in 2020 in UK, one of the richest countries of the world. If you don't have food, access to food, heating, you know, accommodation, how can you sit down and write? You know, where is your ability, your chances? Mm -hmm. um, and I always keep quoting James Kelman, who won the Booker and I think it was in 1990, saying that, you know, working class voices, should be heard as such. So I always say BAME voices should also be heard. And I think it's coming up slowly, but I think Dave might have something more about poverty and perhaps, um, you know, things like COVID perhaps and what it's being done to writers as such. Yeah. Okay, before, before you start, I just wanted to um, mention that um, Scottish Pen has partnered with the Scottish BME Writers Network to launch the Scottish Black Writers Group um, over, over the past few months. Um, the next event is in, uh, oh, I want to say it's the 17th and then there's another in January, I'm not sure, but the information's on our website and also on the Scottish yes. BME Writers Network website. Um, but yeah, that's a, um, 
a great opportunity. It's, all the events are free and they include, um, you know, a, a kind of peer support network, but also the opportunity to hear from established black writers um, and how hear their readings and, and ask questions. So yeah, just for anyone um, who, who might be interested in that, that is a, a kind of current opportunity um, for writers. Uh, sorry, Dave, I kind of cut you off there just before I forgot I wanted to <laughs> mention that. No, no, thanks, Lisa. That was very interesting. Thanks for saying that. Uh, uh, I, I mean, I agree with Leela. Um, you know, um, there's always this thing in uh, when you're trying to place a book, which is, well, we can't, we can't publish that because it won't sell. Yes. Um, but they don't really know. They're just saying that because there's nobody else doing that. Mm -hmm. They said the same to J.K. Rowling, you know, that mm -hmm. we're not going to take that because it'll never sell, you know. <laughs> well, that's a shame, you know. Um, and and I think I think that it's high time the, the, the black and ethnic minorities had more of a voice in uh, every literature, Scottish literature, for sure. Um, and we need it. We, we badly need that sort of thing. Um, uh, Lila uh, sort of mentioned that I might have more to say about along those lines. I would like to just point out another area where um, there's danger of silencing, and that's uh, through legislation. Um, at the moment, um, Scottish Pen is involved with trying to change a bill, the hate crime bill, which is going through the Scottish Parliament. And uh, this is causing all sorts of um, worries for uh, writers who are trying to um, put forward, uh, uh, you know, maybe more controversial points of view or things you believe in firmly that don't necessarily go with the mainstream or whatever. And uh, we've managed to have section four of that bill uh, dropped, I think, uh, and that is to do with public performances where um, people are going to be prosecuted or could have been prosecuted uh, without an offence being proved. And, you know, that sends a chill up my spine for the ideas of censorship and um, you know the the, free, the freedom of of the ability to write um, um, controversially and to take difficult points of view and put them forward is very important. That doesn't mean that you can write from every point of view and you can't say anything you want. So it's where you draw the line is is the, is the tricky thing. And uh, so that was another good thing for um, for Penn to have been involved with. I think that's still ongoing. I think there's a feeling that maybe the Scottish Parliament's response has been a bit lukewarm still. So again, Penn is, is going to try and have that pushed further. Um, but I, I think maybe another thing I'd like to just pick up on is um, with between COVID and between all the things we're facing at the moment, austerity, COVID, Brexit, they're having a huge impact on us socially. Um, mental health, writers' mental health mm -hmm. is perhaps never been under such attack before. Um, you know, it's hard enough to make a living as a freelance writer anyway, never mind try to piece together a, um, a, a living from doing uh, bits and pieces to try and get uh, enough money to, to survive on, to go on writing. And that community has been under huge threat, but not just that community, anybody who tries to write is coming up against things like depression, isolation, and loneliness, like the rest of the population. And I think there's probably a, a perfect storm of mental health difficulties taking place yet. And we haven't even scraped that. We don't really know what's happening out there with COVID, et cetera. Not yet, we haven't really come to terms with that. So that's a big thing. Gross of use of food banks and stuff is going, of course, as well. And just, just the sort of wave of poverty that's going to come through and is coming through is quite frightening. Um, and that's when people tend to be silenced. They're silenced by those sorts of things. Um, and I also, I mean, Shuggy Bain, the, the publication of Shuggy Bain is terrific for Scottish writing. But look what he's writing about. He's writing about uh, poverty-stricken families raising children in, in the 80s. And mm -hmm. it seems so, it seems so contemporary. Um, so um, I'm glad it's won the Booker Prize. Um, but the, we have we don't seem to have moved on very much, not really. Yeah, and just on that um, the, the, the subject of um, hate crime as well, it's 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 that balancing act of um, defending free expression, but also recognizing that hate crime is a big reason why many um, marginalized groups aren't don't aren't free to express themselves because they're 
they're facing that discrimination and that hatred and um, it's maybe been too easy in the uh, kind of public debate so far to um, suggest that this legislation will kind of, you know, suppress <laughs> free expression. And it's actually, there's a great opportunity there for many people who uh, don't have their voices heard to feel a bit safer that they can do so. And, that, um, you know, that um, the law is on their side and that they'll be protected. So um, we've definitely seen a lot of um, really positive changes in the legislation through that process. And, um, it, it does have a, yeah, legislation does have a big part to play in what kind of message is sent about whose voice is valued and who isn't. But yeah, as you've said, so does the fact that, um, you know, writers aren't being well supported at the moment. And um, that, that, that sends a message as well about the kind of work that's valued, the kind of creativity that's valued or, or not. Um, and what, what kind of society is that going to allow to, to just plunge into the depths, you know? Um, it, it really is a tough time for um, writers in Scotland in many ways. Um, do, I'd be curious to know um, how you feel. Do you think that writers have a, a kind of responsibility to highlight these kind of social injustices in their work and kind of respond to the political context that they find themselves in? Or is it maybe more important that writers just have the freedom to kind of subvert those expectations and you know follow their own imaginations um, and not be kind of pigeonholed and you should be writing about this issue because you experienced it or you're living in this context so that's all you can write about you know how do you feel about that kind of um, balancing act for, for writers? Do you want to try this one Leela? <laughs> <laughs> yeah I wouldn't mind um, in my own book uh, and I'm not trying to plug it but basically <laughs> Uh, the reason why I decided that I would take uh, an Asian, Scottish Asian um, detective was really to, through him, also show a bit about the community, you know, that there are different communities living within Scotland and, you know, the, the experiences, their lives um, and the tensions even between different groups within the community. There's always this kind of uh, ideas a homogenous or a you know a little monolithic Asian community, but there are language differences, there are religious differences, there are uh, cultural differences within each group, and of course you've got the Chinese, uh, and even within the Chinese groups, as you know, there are Vietnamese and you know mainland China and Hong Kong, and uh, and I think that there is just this feeling that if you put everything on a BAME, it's all a kind of you know uh, one big mass, which is fine, it's not going to sell many books because, you know, it is the minority. In fact, 7% of the population, I believe, in Scotland is um, of, uh, uh, no, sorry, 3% of the population in Scotland is of BAME, but the number of people who use their second language is 7%. But in some city centres like Edinburgh and Glasgow, it's, it's as much as 13% of the population, and there are some uh, including some of the Chinese uh, uh, members, or should I say of the society, who have not either learned the language or are still um, trying to cope with, you know, the language that uh, they've just gleaned from living here. So it's, it's um, the question of a writer and what they should actually, is it the responsibility? I think one of the first questions, one uh, another BAME writer asked me, should I only write about Asians or my experience? And I said, no, as a writer, you have total freedom to write what you want. In my own book, I've got a periphery estate, you know, people coming from Drum Chapel. And I had to put myself in the shoes of a person who is really, you know, had to access the food bank and what his life is like and what, what are the circumstances that led to him. Uh, and I don't think that is cultural appropriation at all. You know, we are in a global village. We have to be able to be able to write from different perspective. Um, and I think when Bernadine Everesto bringing out the, the book um, is a positive move. You know, you're, you're now familiar with the Afro-Caribbean culture um, living in London and yet it was a universal thing, you know, women's experience. And I think that's extremely important. So as a writer, I would think it's a responsibility to 
to write what you think is important and you know what you feel would, is, is something that is universal that all of us experience. And I think it, it crosses barriers, borders, religions, whatever. We're all human beings at the end of the day. So uh, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Perfect um, answer. <laughs> what have you got anything to add, Dave? Yeah, just um, thinking of something that uh, I've been very interested in just recently that's pertinent to the debate. I mean, uh, one of the big uh, issues is Europeans and post-colonialism yeah. and uh, European literature and post-colonialism. And, uh, you know, there was an essay written by um, the Penn president, Jennifer Cle Clement, which was um, debated uh, hotly uh, at a particular Penn meeting, an international meeting. And half the delegates thought, uh, it's called um, the democracy of the imagination. Half the delegates totally agreed with it, and the other half totally disagreed. Mm -hmm. And they came from, you know, the ones who disagreed tended to come from African, etc., countries. Um, so it was one of these issues that is really very um, strong, uh, and there's a there's a very strong divide. Um, one of the way, one of the writers I've been really uh, enjoying reading at the moment um, is somebody who uh, went to live in New Zealand. And he, he, he adapted a play by um, a, a short story called The Beach of Falasar by Robert Louis Stevenson. Mm -hmm. So I read up a lot about The Beach of Falasar and I get, came across books by Joseph Farrell and also Jenny Calder, who uh, look at Stevenson's um, encounters with Samoa and put the case strongly, and I, I, I accept it, that when Stevenson became politically um, active, uh, he engaged in a way with the world around him that he'd never done before. There were other factors, like he was much healthier at the time, mm -hmm. but he became energetic. He saw from different points of view. He saw the corrupt nature of empire in Samoa, where he was living. And I think the, I think he became a better writer because of it. So there's another way in which, um, you know, um, silencing and finding voice can, can be gained. By, by engaging, by becoming part of the world and looking at current affairs and becoming, if you like, enraged by um, certain positions that you don't agree with and, uh, you know, just, just developing that kind of critical faculty. So I think that's quite, a, quite an important uh, thing for writers to do. And there's plenty of opportunity to do it now uh, as the world changes. Thanks. Um... I'm keen that we have some time for questions before we round things up. So I'll maybe just ask for um, your response to one more question and maybe we can keep it brief and then uh, hear some questions from attendees. Um, so <laughs> just as a way of rounding things up, where would you say we are now? And what do you think the future for writing in Scotland looks like? <laughs> Dave, you want to go first? <laughs> or shall I go first? I'll finish it and then you can round it off, I think. That might be better. Okay. okay. Right? Um, sure. I think uh, a lot of uh, um, positive things about Scotland, uh, you know, having the BAME come, network coming up, Scottish men going with the uh, Black um, Writers uh, workshops. You've got the GWL, Glasgow Women's Library, which is doing a lot. And you've got to try and remember feminism and women's rights took, took ages, you know, after the legislation to actually to get where we are. And we still haven't reached the kind of equal pay and domestic violence is still, you know, something that is that is not left our culture. And uh, But I think where are we right now? I think we can't be complacent. We have to make sure that we keep our eyes peeled. Um, and I think perhaps the um, 21st century is something that with technology, the fact that we are able to meet through um, Zoom is going to bring the world you know, much smaller. And I think the publishing um, industry should also become more aware, more proactive if possible. I've often heard about, uh, I do know of one particular writer who just gave up writing because he felt his books were not even being published in England. You know, it's become like a, a niche, Scotland, and perhaps a very Edinburgh-based, you know, feeling. And uh, so I think that needs to change. It has to become a, a bit more, you know, and the English 
publishing industry, the big five has also got to look at, okay, we've got wonderful Canon Gate and, and other uh, amazing publishers, um, Sarah Band, which has come up recently, but um, I read somewhere uh, that it's still quite difficult for Scottish writers to be taken on and distributed, marketed the way English writers are. So um, that's my thing. And of course, the other thing is the BAME, you know, the diaspora, that the markets, whether it's in India or Africa or, you know, China, that has to be explored too, I think. Well, for me, I think that I agree with what uh, Lila says. And, uh, you know, I'm really... Uh, interested in young writers coming through and what they're doing that adds to what we've already got. A writer I like very much at the moment is Kevin P. Gilday, who is producing a lot of uh, lovely stuff. Uh, I've got his collection called Sad Songs for White Boys. <laughs> and it's political and it's funny as well. And it's, uh, I just really like that kind of um, being able to reproduce a point of view, which itself is probably quite marginalised and, and is is, is seeing its uh, role in the world and, and saying something new. And uh, I would like um, people like him and other writers who write here to be, have the opportunity to be uh, sold abroad and sold, uh, as Lila was saying, down south and sold to the rest of the world. You know, we, we, we can perhaps chime better with other countries than with the London market. It's a huge world. Perhaps we shouldn't be thinking about internationalism, but transnationalism just be meaning making small incursion, incursions into other cultures, uh, maybe getting involved with more translation from English or from Scots into other languages, because that is actually a barrier to English speaking writers, that translation isn't open to them, whereas in smaller countries it is. And, um, you know, if we could do something like that, we could maybe change things. It's a huge thing to change, but perhaps we can do a little at a time, it might make all the difference. Thanks both. Um, okay, so we've got, we've got a good 10 minutes left. So um, I don't know about yourselves, but I haven't been keeping track of the Q&A as we've been going along. I don't know if Helen can help us out with by sharing our, any questions we have for our writers. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yes, so we have, we've had uh, we have a couple of questions here um, and uh, a couple that, that I'd like to, to ask as well. Mm -hmm. um, so our first question, um, and I'll obviously I'll kind of ask both of you to kind of respond if you can to this. Um, how how does Penn go about defending freedom of speech when that freedom is also being used by reactionary forces to spread lies? I think this is you know around uh, manipula uh, manipulation. Um, who's trusted? <laughs> Would you like to take that Did subject? I can I give that a go? Yeah. yeah. Well, the answer is it's very difficult to uh, defend freedom of speech when uh, freedom is being used by reactionary forces. And that's exactly the issue. Um, everybody wants to say they're doing freedom of speech in order to say whatever it is they want. And some groups are extremely irresponsible when they talk about freedom of speech. They would say they're, they're not, of course, but I would say that unless you have a humane attitude and unless you have the ability to see somebody else's point of view and to be um, to think to bring literature and humanity together rather than drive them apart, um, then you're 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 going the wrong way. But it is a big problem. I mean, if you look at the growth of conspiracy theory uh, across the world, um, uh, if you look at uh, perhaps, shall we say, pernicious presidents who talk um, about fake news and stuff like that, you look at um, groups like QAnon, which spring up, um, uh, people who genuinely believe that the pandemic is a hoax and aren't going to wear masks as a result of it. Um, and they do genuinely believe that um, it's been cooked up by, is it, I'm not sure who they're saying it's been cooked up by, but it's being it's just being put forward as a way of, of removing our, our f freedoms. Again, that word freedom is used to, mm -hmm. this is what I want, so I should have that. And, um, you know, it's really it's really a difficult time for that because, because perhaps because of social media, nobody knows what the truth is or, or there's all sorts of contests as to what the truth is. 
if you make the truth up and it becomes truth because somebody says it, we're in serious bother, serious, serious times. Could I just add, um, you know, I agree with all that Dave has said just now. And uh, it's also worrying when you look at something like what's happening in France, when, uh, you know, Article 10 has said quite clearly about the freedom of expression um, and they are taking it to the letter and the consequences are so difficult at times. So we have to find what I think David said right, Dave said right at the beginning, you know, it has to be something which has a humane uh, aspect to it. You know, you can't just have freedom of expression where you can write anything, do anything. And I know that I think it was it yesterday that Facebook has been said to be monopolizing and, you know, not taking care of uh, enough of the uh, wrong kind of things that's being mentioned in it, you know, in the comments and the messages and uh, not enough censorship there. Um, so I think it's a, uh, to defend freedom of speech is going to be difficult in this kind of um, age, I think, where a button could send in, you know, a press ascend and, and you know, go, go in with, what is it? Alternate facts is one of the famous women said. So it's difficult. Uh, yeah, if, you, I could, if I could just add something again to that as well. The pen sort of charter uses terms that are a little bit, people might see them as old fashioned, things like mutual respect. Yes. Uh, unhampered transmission of thought, uh, looking after art and humanity. And it's really very difficult now to find middle ground that people agree on. People want to have fights and are going to oppose each other. And they say the, the hatred that comes through, I've seen examples of on Twitter, has been, has been chilling. And people seem to feel free to say it casually. Um, and, and that generates a lot of problems. Oh, so thank what you. What the answer is, I don't know. It's interesting what you're saying for, you know, Just Festival itself, uh, when we entered into kind of social media and Facebook posting around some of our events, thinking everyone will love these. These are, these are you know, open, they're humane, they're about our rights. The comments froze me. I actually didn't realize, I thought all of that happened somewhere else. I lived in such a bubble. And it was a moment of thinking, how, how do people feel so they got the, they can write this, you know, in public? And what am I supposed to do with this? So I was quite shocked. I was brought into a very different experience of the world that I thought I was in, um, that the, where all the hate crime and all that kind of vitriol that was in social media somehow happens in some other kind of report in some other world. It was right in my face. And I was quite shocked by it. But. Lisa, do you want to take the next question on the... Sure. Okay. Um, so do you think it is possible to strike a balance on social media platforms or other platforms between the suppression of flawed information being used to maliciously influence content observers? Content observers? Mm -hmm. um, yeah and the promotion of alternative points of view which challenge the status quo of opinion with integrous intent. So it's that kind of, um, yeah, the balance of <laughs> challenging um, points of view and suppressing that kind of flawed information that, that we've kind of alluded to already. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think yeah. we've touched on it already in the last one, how we do feel helpless when these huge conglomerates um, like Facebook and WhatsApp and um, the other one, Insta, you know, there are influencers, but you've also got to remember there's something called the dark net or something. I'm not, I mean, I'm not okay with that at all, but I've been told that the uh, cyber crime prevention, um, you know, body that we have within the Met and the MI5, et cetera, they deal with, just horrendous things. So uh, I don't know as writers how we can balance. The question was, can you balance it? You know, this the ones with the malicious intent. I think we can do our best within our capabilities, but personally, I'm not very sure uh, unless there's some kind of legislation 
um, and some kind of censorship of these huge, um, and I'm even including Amazon, which takes your profile about what to sell to you and influence you in some way. I mean, that's nothing to do with writing, but um, you know, but it does, I've heard about reviews which are posted, which can be bought or something like that, you know, so uh, even writers are being affected in that way. So can we find a balance uh, as a, a lonely writer or a single writer, perhaps not, but, you know, I think there needs to be some legislation a feeling it will be on the horizon, you know, for sure. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think that it's a good question because it sort of puts the, it asks the crucial, yes. can, can it be achievable? And I think the only answer I can think of giving is that it must be, we must find a way to do this because the alternative can't be, can't be allowed. And uh, whether that's done through legislation or, um, um, you know, um, breaking up huge conglomerates that are beginning to control, it seems, what we think and how we behave. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, but I think it's a big, big issue for today. And we can't have, you know, the, the just just um, activities and just results um, are very dependent on that. Um, because um, in a, a, many issues, people are at each other's throats and it seems uncontrollable. But I think we must we must try and do this. Yeah. I mean, can I can I ask a question around um, self censorship, which I think is very interesting. Um, in you know, I know you're talking about. I mean, people are experiencing COVID, and and and, and a huge swathes of the country are actually experiencing real oppression and poverty and difficulty and hopelessness of ways of getting out of this. However. Where is the writing that's really angry? Where is, are we complacent? Uh, are we compliant mm -hmm. and a bit comfortable in some ways as a kind, as a, a middle class kind of artistic community who are not angry enough about what's going on? I mean, do you, when people, you talk about being, people being silenced and you think, well, actually one of the places I reach to at my times of of darkest trouble is I start to write. And actually not at the times when I'm at my at my most at my ease, but actually when I'm, I'm and I'm thinking about the, you know, the people you've mentioned at the beginning of this um, session of the journalists and the writers and the people who have spoken out in extraordinary circumstances. We don't see ourselves in extraordinary circumstances. Is there something wrong with that? You want to go, Viva? Um, well, I think that there are, I mean, you know that uh, the, from the pro poet laureates who are writing poems about a pandemic, there are actual poetry platforms where people are actually writing uh, and sending poems. Aberdeen University has got the lockdown lore with the archiving of what, you know, the pandemic has produced. Uh, I, I think um, the, the films that are being made, the, you know, it'll, it, I think they're all just settling into this totally new, unexpected. I mean, last March, beginning of March, we didn't expect our lives to be turned upside down. Yeah. So I think the human nature is to, to try and cope with what we have to begin with uh, and then see, you know, uh, we go through this uh, stage of perhaps acceptance, but I think there is a lot of anger. There's certainly, I think, uh, writing being done. Uh, perhaps it's not published yet because you know the publishing industry and it's, I mean, it's been delayed even more because of COVID printers, etc., because of illness and whatever, everything has been delayed. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a huge raft of, of um, genuine feeling that will be out. I'm, I'm positive about that, but it's an excellent question, Helen. Absolutely right. Because Albert Camus wrote the famous plague book, you know, with, with the last one. So, mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure it'll be there. I'm sure. Yeah, I think it's a great question as well. A really, really vital question. And uh, as uh, these things are sinking in with me, and uh, you know, um, uh, I've been quite comfortable in my job and uh, all sorts of things. Um, and you know, I'm now find myself looking at uh, films and reading books which are a bit more political, a bit more edgy, uh, and and socially real. 
So I think the sort of realism could well make a comeback. And I've, I've loved crime books and I think they're fantastic. And I think there's not enough BAME crime writers. I'm looking forward to reading Murder at the Mela. Uh, but the socially real stuff is maybe, you know, going to have a big uh, surge upwards. Um, as, a, as mainstream books, these things can be seen as not great sellers mm -hmm. until, of course, somebody sells a million, such as Shuggy Bain. And, um, you know, um, I watched a film called Fish Tank the other night that I thought was absolutely fantastic. And just people who are putting stuff on the line as, uh, you know, people being marginalised and surviving and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we've done it before in Scotland, the work of Kelman and people like that from the from the 80s. And I think that we could see a return of that. And I, I would quite like to see that. Yeah. Um, so one, there's, there's one more question and a kind of a, a quick question from me, and then I'm going to hand it over to Lisa for, for her end. Um, uh, when you're talking about, the, you know, I'm interested in the difference between fiction and fiction and realism. Do you think fiction can, is more powerful than realism? Uh, as it kind of as it kind of lifts us into a different understanding potentially or you know again around the self-censorship but fiction you can allude to things that you're more frightened to criticize through mm -hmm. through through fiction I mean I am thinking you know we were in Scotland we have independence coming up we've got Brexit coming up we've got all these things uh, the people who fund as I the writers and the artists have a lot of power and a lot of influence. We don't want to upset people, do we? We should be upsetting everybody. We should be challenging. How do we balance those? You know, how do we get people in freedom of expression? Is it ever free when you're publicly funded? There's a question. Good questions. Good Very good question. <laughs> she kept the hard questions to the last. <laughs> uh, I think that there's a brand of fiction which is realist, which is not um, real. You know, uh, fi fictional characters are used and they can be very cleverly used to, uh, to raise political questions, often in circumstances that are very difficult. I remember reading a book by a guy called Stephen Heim once, which is called The King David Report, and it's set in biblical times, but it was really about East Germany written by a guy who wasn't allowed to read, allowed to write that. But if you read it as an allegory for East Germany, it's perfectly obvious what his comments on authoritarianism are. So he was using fiction as a means of getting round, not being able to say stuff. And it, it is a great, a terrific book. So um, fiction's so flexible and so malleable and so it carries such depth and it can have such weight. And that can be about such apparently small things, but are really big. Um, I think, uh, it, you know, I, I pin my faith on it still, you know, I think, I think that we can, we can invent an art form or come back to an art form, which was, is going to make changes, going to be what we need, you know, in these times of, of trouble. Yeah, I, I would agree with David. I think, uh, again, you know, time from time memorial people have, you know, whether it's Kafka's Metamorphosis, whether it is shows in its skin, you know, writing about the Gulag archipelago, you know, through Van Densovich. We've got authors using fiction to actually address what is happening, you know, and then of course they've been banned and imprisoned and sent away to, to you know, uh, places that uh, were not very congenial for writing. Um, I think that's always going to happen, but I think Dave had this very um, good point about perhaps a new genre that uh, would address all these um, points as such. But yeah, uh, it's very strange circumstances we're living through. And, and I'm sure there are people who are extremely angry and it will come out, I think, and, and whether it is fiction or I think it will be addressed, yes. Uh -huh. Lisa, do you want to take the last question and then, and then sign us off after this? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, there it is. Okay, sorry. Simple scroll. <laughs> um, okay, so do writers need to start inventing a new language, new words to address the complexity of the freedoms that facilitate fake news? 
Shall I? Do you want to? Shall I? Shall I? Do you mean is it okay? Go yeah, ahead, I'll, go, I'll go for that. Um, I'm not a big fan of using terms that haven't been used bef before in order to produce a, a language which can be quite obfuscating and uh, produce other issues. Um, uh, I don't want to use any of these terms because they can often be very controversial. And I think that they can often come from groups which have political views themselves. On the other hand, um, it is complex to negotiate the idea of uh, freedom uh, from fake news. Um, but I'm not sure it's to do with the language. I think it's to do with some sort of change in our way that we believe things. Um, um, uh, the lang language, you know, contested terms can be very tricky, obviously. Um, Stevenson used the term in, in uh, the Beach of Falasa that I can't say legally, and it's still there in print. I don't think it's wrong for it to be there in print because he's writing from, uh, he's talking about somebody who's racist talking. So there's an example of where I'm thinking that the that, that, that controversies over language maybe sometimes censor things themselves. But of course we live in modern times and we can't just allow every term to be used. So um, I guess the answer is, I suppose I don't know, <laughs> but um, I have a feeling myself, I, I don't like to see language changed for other ends. Myself, that's a personal view. I think I'll keep it short. I agree with, with Dave and I think uh, we've already got new words in our language we were not familiar with, you know, whether it is uh, uh, PPE or, you know, social distancing or whatever. But I know there's some more serious question about, uh, you know, uh, freedom of expression. And uh, uh, I'm not very sure if, if, I think we'll negotiate with the language we have rather than uh, finding new words. Um, yeah. So that's, that's my answer, thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, for some reason, no one asked my view, but I have some reason thinking about um, how um, kind of marginalised communities in the past have created their own language as a way to kind of subvert and have conversations in a safe way. I'm thinking of, you know, like Polari for um, yeah, yeah, communities in the past and how yeah. creating, a new, creating new words and new languages can, can be quite freeing in a way that you're able to... Um, speak in a group uh, context that uh, feels a bit safer um but yeah <laughs> anyway um I, I get the feeling we could just keep talking and um i really appreciate helen's questions at the end there about um i think it's a great kind of energy and spirit to end the event on that you know today is human rights day and maybe we do need to be angry and <laughs> confrontational and um we've, we've talked about a lot of really pressing and urgent issues tonight and um, it, I, I, it's so important that we don't lose that um, that sense of urgency and standing up for the values that um, I know Scottish Pen uh, works really hard to defend so um, thank you so much to everyone for coming along tonight and um, yeah please um, I, I believe the, vid the recording of the event is going to be on YouTube quite shortly after tonight so um, if you know anyone who had hoped to come along but wasn't able to make it, um, yeah, but please feel free to share that link when it's out there. And um, as for Scottish Pen, we're on um, Twitter, <laughs> all these problematic places we've been talking about tonight. <laughs> you can find us there. Um, we, we've just published today um, uh, Penning Magazine, which um, includes a feature piece on uh, Varavara Rao, who we talked about at the start of the event. So there's a lot of really great poetry and short fiction there to um, access for free. Oh. Can, I just, <laughs> can I just say something about the Declarations book on sale now? Terrific stuff in it, all to do with the declarations of our growth from Scottish Pen. So yeah, um, lots lots of stuff to get into. And um, please do, if you have any questions about Scottish Pen's work or what we're doing at the moment, then you can find contact information on our website as well. So let's keep the conversation going. And um, thanks so much to uh, Just Festival for the opportunity to have this conversation tonight. We really, really appreciate it. And it's been great to, great to work together. Lovely to have you. Thank you very much indeed.
So we're thank going to bring you. the event to a close and we'll wave and say thank you all for attending and good night. You hear the ambulance whizzing past my window, I'm sure. But uh, thank you very much now. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.